I've been building houses for about 20 years. I'm also a deep environmentalist, and I believe that as a person who builds houses, we should be building them the most efficient and effective way possible so we make the least amount of impact on the environment. And unfortunately, until about two or three years ago, I didn't really understand the difference between embodied carbon and operational carbon. Well, today we're going to talk about the differences and why you should care about both. So let's get into it. So, what is the difference between operational carbon and embodied carbon? Well, I think it's important to understand the actual carbon picture itself. Now, if you look at this figure here, you'll see that this is the entire carbon footprint or the amount of carbon dioxide that we produce in the planet, on the planet. And what you'll see is that the amount of carbon attributed to the buildings that we live in or work in or reside or play in is about 20% of the entire amount of carbon that we produce. So it's more than pretty much anything except industry itself. Now, think about this. This is all the buildings that we have on the planet now. This is buildings that we built a thousand years ago, buildings that were built 10 years ago, and buildings that were built yesterday. But if you look at the amount of energy attributed or the amount of carbon attributed to building materials, so actually making those building materials to build those buildings, it's actually only about 8%. So now you think, well, the building materials is actually a very small portion of the actual carbon produced by buildings. And if you look at it in that way, that's correct. But here's the thing, that 8% of building materials, that's not all of the buildings. That's only the buildings that are getting built today or remodeled today or specifically this year. So in fact, when you look at it that way, maybe only 1% of buildings are being remodeled or built in a year, if that. So now we have this outsized portion. The amount of, of carbon attributed to building materials is actually incredible compared to the amount that operates all the other buildings on the planet. Now, what do we think about when we think about operational carbon? What does it even mean? Well, operational carbon is the greenhouse gas emissions, specifically carbon dioxide, with the operation of a building or its energy consumption. So that includes electrical and gas, and if you're in some parts of the world, uh, fuel oil or even wood, okay? And it covers things like space heating, space cooling, ventilation, water heating, lighting, plug loads, and any other equipment in that building. So now, if we go back and look at that graph again, we see that that 20% of the operations of all the buildings on the planet goes to those functions. Then how do we look at this building materials, this 8%, which has this outsized impact on the carbon usage in the planet? And we see that, in fact, that 8% is actually divided a bunch of, bunch of different categories. It's divided into the extraction of the material. So if it's lumber, about the chopping down of the trees or about the digging up of the uh, dirt to make uh, copper or iron. It's about the manufacture of those materials, the milling of the lumber or the smelting of the steel. It's about the transportation of those materials from where they're manufactured to where they're used. It's about the construction, so building that building. It's about running the generators or the tools, the saws or the cranes. It's about the maintenance of that building. So that's not operational carbon, the maintenance, so the actual Fixing of existing materials or fixing of existing systems is part of, part of that embodied carbon. It's about the refurbishment. So meaning if you take and remodel your house, the materials that you use for the refurbishment of that house is part of the embodied carbon. If you build a house that's 50 years old, uh, sorry, if you have a house that's 50 years old and you remodel it, the environmental impact of that remodeling is part of the embodied carbon footprint of that building. Now, if you build a building that only lasts five years before it gets remodeled versus one that lasts 25 years before you get remodeled, the one that has to be remodeled every five years is gonna have five times the embodied carbon relating to those uh, remodeling activities as the one that was designed to last 50 years. So durability of materials becomes a really, really important part of the embodied carbon uh, calculation. We also talk about the demolition, so the end of life of that material uh, and what happens to that material once it uh, is demolished. Does it get reused in recycling or does it go straight into a landfill? So all of these elements have a dramatic impact on the embodied carbon of a building. 
So the embodied carbon is the greenhouse gas emissions going to the manufacturing, transportation, installation, installation, maintenance, and disposal of the building materials of a building. So if we look at it, a building life cycle, we look at the embodied carbon correlating to the uh, extraction, transport, and manufacture of that material, then the construction phase, which is the transport to the site, and the construction of the building. And then this whole section right here is really about the management of that building, but there's an operational carbon portion and there's an embodied carbon portion. And then we have the end of life, embodied carbon, and then the beyond the life expectancy, the reuse or the demo of that material. Now, if you look at it in this respect, we have uh, some phrases that are fairly common in the building industry that may not be part of the lexicon of the average person. And we have what's called cradle to gate, which means the gate of the manufacturing facility. So cradle is where it was, that material was originally harvested uh, and or dug up or, you know, however it was found. Then to the gate of the, the manufacturing facility. And then we have cradle to grave. Now grave is the end of life. So that goes from finding that raw material supply to the end of when that building is, uh, has been recycled or reused or demolished. And then cradle to cradle is the entire ability of a material. So it's a steel. So it's dug up from the earth. It's then smelted and made into a product which is used in a building and then it's demolished and then it's recycled. And so what we get is a circular economy. So now that material undergoes reuse, recovery, or recycling potential. So it's gonna have a lot less energy because it doesn't go through at least these first two impacts uh, to the amount of bombarding carbon it uses. And so if we look at the amount of energy that goes from building materials to building operations, in a modern style house between 2015 and 2050, about 90% of the carbon is gonna be attributed to the building materials and only 10% to building operations. Now that means that it's gonna take many, many years of building operations. And you can assume that this is kind of on an annual basis, right? That you're gonna have efficient buildings that produce about a 10th of the amount of energy, or sorry, consume about a 10th of the amount of energy that it took to build those buildings to begin with. Now, 10 years uh, from now, you're gonna have 100% or 10X of this building operations, which means that in 10 years, that building's operations are gonna be more demanding or more impactful than building materials. Now, what happens if we had a building that actually had a lot less uh, operational carbon. So the amount of energy that it used on an annual basis was actually significantly less than that 10%. Well, if you look at it in a graph form, we see that we have this embodied carbon of the building from its building from the original kind of bulk materials. And then we have it in the operational carbon. So here we have an operational carbon of a normal building. And here, kind of in these hashed marks, we actually have the operational carbon of a more efficient building. And we see that there's a dramatic difference in how that building functions. Now, over time, the operational carbon of that building is going to go down as things get more efficient. And you see that this standard building is going to get more and more efficient. And while our super operational carbon building is also going to get super uh, more efficient to the point at some point, maybe 20 or 30 years in the future, it's using hardly any energy. And we'll see that when all of these are combined, you can actually get a much lower total carbon from the building of that building and the usage of that building for years and years. Now, occasionally we're gonna have places where we're gonna remodel that building or we're gonna optimize that building to reduce carbon emissions or to just fix it if it starts to fail. But what happens when we look at the operational material, uh, the operational carbon of that building versus the embodied carbon of that building? And we see that the embodied carbon stays the same. It doesn't change because that embodied carbon is set when you build the building and the operational carbon continues to build and build and build. And you know, maybe 10 or 20, depends on how uh, uh, operationally efficient that building is, at some point that operational carbon is going to get significantly more than the embodied carbon. And when here we say maybe the embodied carbon is 10 times the operational carbon, after 20 or 30 years, the operational carbon may be two times or three times or more than the embodied carbon. And so we have to pay attention to both, not just operational carbon and not just embodied carbon. 
Now, if we look at this in a graph form, it's similar. We have this embodied carbon, which is the amount of carbon dioxide produced to make that building. And then we have this operational carbon. And again, the combination of embodied carbon and operational carbon means that we have this huge stack of carbon over the life of the building. And in fact, in maybe 30 or 50 years, you know, you have three times as much embodied car sorry, operational carbon as you do have embodied carbon. But what happens if that building was actually much more efficient? Maybe it's now using two thirds of the amount of energy and it's using a lot less operational carbon. And so what we're seeing is that that operational carbon versus embodied carbon mathematics depends not only on the amount of operational carbon that that building uses over time, but it also depends on the type of building that were built. So if we look at a heavy building like a concrete or steel building, we actually have a lot of embodied carbon in the concrete and the steel. And we also have some in the envelope in the interiors and the mechanical and electrical and plumbing systems. But the majority of the embodied carbon is in the steel and the concrete. But if we look at a light wood frame building, so standard construction for residential construction, we actually have a significantly less impact on the embodied carbon. Uh, and that structure is you know, 25 to 50% less uh, embodied carbon for the same amount of square footage. Now, why is that? Well, there's a lot more concrete in big heavy buildings. There's also a lot more steel in big heavy buildings. So we have a lot less concrete and almost no steel. And wood actually has a very, very tiny amount of embodied carbon because it's a natural product. It fixes carbon, which means carbon goes into it that doesn't get released into the atmosphere. So really the majority of the embodied carbon of the wood is in chopping that wood down, milling it and transporting it to your site. So what happens if we don't actually build a new building and we reuse an existing building? Well, you can take all of this embodied carbon from the concrete or the wood or the steel and use it uh, and not actually reproduce it. And so when we use, the, we reuse a building, we're using 50 to 80% less carbon or producing 50 to 80% less carbon because we're completely saving the steel and the concrete or the wood of that building and we're not producing that uh, material any good. So how do we think about it when we build new projects or when we remodel new projects? Well, first of all, we're gonna reuse buildings if we can. We're gonna build buildings that have a smaller footprint and we're gonna program them. We're gonna make it so that we're efficiently using the materials that we have. Then we're gonna build smart. We're gonna actually use alternate materials that have lower embodied carbon. Maybe even they have the same embodied carbon, but they're much more durable. So they're not gonna to have to be re replaced nearly as often. And as we talked about earlier, that's gonna dramatically reduce the embodied carbon of that building over time. We're gonna use make more efficient buildings. The more efficient building doesn't decrease embodied carbon, but it dramatically decreases in uh, the operational carbon, reducing the lifetime carbon of that building. And lastly, again, we're going to think about durability. We're going to think about how long that la building lasts. Are we going to make that building so it can be easily remodeled? Or are we going to make it so there's no way we can remodel it? Are we going to use a style of building that's going to last for generations and not go with the whims of the current in-style building? And lastly, we're gonna buy materials that have transparency built in. So are we gonna trust a company that sells us a material and hides most of the component materials? Or are we gonna buy material from a building that, or sorry, from a manufacturing company that actually tells us exactly what's in that building? Now, that's not only good for embodied carbon and operational carbon, because now we understand that building material, it's actually good for human health or for uh, occupant health. If we know exactly what goes into that building material and we make sure that it doesn't contain toxic materials that we want to keep out of our buildings, that's going to be a healthier building. And we know that when we pay attention to healthy buildings, we pay attention to the occupant's health. Those occupants are actually healthier. Sunlight, clean air, uh, fresh, uh, non-toxic air, non-toxic building materials, that's gonna make people happier. So if it's an office building, it's gonna make them more efficient. It's gonna make them stay at work longer. If it's a house, it's gonna keep people healthier longer. It's gonna not challenge people. We've all heard of sick building syndrome. Like, I can't imagine something more worse than going into a house, especially if you buy that house and it's your first house and it makes your family sick. Like, there just is nothing worse than that, right? Because now you're kind of stuck. We're also going to talk about making, maybe changing the policies, becoming more efficient and more 
uh, deliberate in how we build projects. The code, while I talk about the code as being a little bit antiquated, the code protects us from toxic building materials. It protects us from high utility bills. It protects us from houses that don't last very long or are potentially injurious to our health. Uh, I actually love the code in that respect and I highly re respect the people who enforce the code because the code is designed to build better buildings. So if you're interested in learning more about building science or building a better way, please hit subscribe as we show you how to build a better way.